Great. Thank you. So um, I just want to confirm, can you see my slides there? Is that? Looks yeah. great, Eleanor. Fantastic. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me along this evening. It's a great opportunity to talk uh, to your audience and um, I feel very privileged that you've been, you know, been invited along. Um, I should qualify, I'm not a, a space scientist, I'm an Earth, Earth scientist. Um, and I'm, as Wayne mentioned, I'm particularly interested in understanding and monitoring um, changes that are going on in our coast. So particularly uh, coastal response to climate change. So when you think about it, the, the, you know, the recent extension of Earth observation opportunities beyond uh, commercial or conventional space agency platforms, including things like UAVs and CubeSats, which we get really excited about in, in our training centre at Sydney Uni and UNSW. So these, these opportunities really allow for dedicated um, and synchronous measurements of the dynamic uh, aspects of coastal landscapes, which we all appreciate, particularly under high sea conditions that, that some of these recent storms have brought about. We're dealing with highly dynamic environments and we want to get, gain insights on how these environments are responding to, to ch changes in climate, whether that be changes associated with differences in sea level or increased ocean acidification. Um, and I'll go on to explain why that's important and why Earth observation, particularly at the moment, is really important for being able to get a handle on this. So the image that you can see here on the slide uh, was taken by a CubeSat, um, or a constellation of CubeSats through the planet uh, program. This is actually one of the original ones from, from Planet Labs. We've obviously got a new set of um, platforms through, the, through this uh, constellation of CubeSats, which is called Planet Scope. But this is, um, some of you might recognise, it's really, we're looking at here is the sandbanks that fan out from the south passage of the narrow channel between Morton Island and North Stradbroke Island. Um, and once we start looking at these coastal systems from an aerial synoptic perspective, we can get a much better understanding of what's actually going on and appreciation of the coastal processes that we really need to get a handle on if we're going to understand how our coasts could change over time. So we're interested in fairly systematic observations um, and we can achieve these through space-based platforms coupled with now a growing global network, if you like, of in situ observing systems. So ocean buoys and tidal gauges and monitoring systems that have been set up in coastal and, and marine environments, which are coupled with a you know, proliferation of space-based um, satellite data. So we're interested in what the implications of these disruptive spatial technologies are for coastal science and understanding our coastlines. And you're probably all familiar with um, extreme marine heat waves that have affected, and it's certainly been uh, in the media a lot, particularly with COP26, um, what, how are you know, important coral reef systems in the Great Barrier Reef and in the northwest of this, Western Australia are impacted by marine heat waves. But at the same time, the extreme 2016 heat wave affected the Great Barrier Reef and resulted in um, uh, coral bleaching. There was an extensive loss and dieback of mangroves in the Gulf of Carpentaria. You know, hundreds of kilometres of um, mangroves died over a very short period of time. And scientists really need to understand what was actually causing, what were the drivers behind that. And the only way to do it, you're dealing with really vast areas of coast and um, really remote areas. So the only way to do that is through space-based observation. So what I want to go through briefly this afternoon is you know, how we use space-based platforms for global monitoring of coastal and marine environments. Um, what that actually means, how we use UAVs to be able to test some of the novel instrumentation design before they go into, into space. Um, and obviously CubeSats, uh, which I won't go into describe because I'm, I'm sure you're probably already familiar with CubeSats, but I'll talk a lot about their applications. And I guess I want to finish with sort of thinking inside the box. How do CubeSats allow us to look at different um, ways of monitoring our coast? Um, and how can it sort of enhance what these sorts of insights that we can gain? So when you think about it, the sensors, the Earth observation sensors that sit on satellite platforms are affected by two mediums, atmosphere and water. So up to 90% of the signal that's received by sensors in orbit 
comes from the atmosphere. So a lot we have to throw away. We can't actually use that data to really understand what's going on on the coast. Additionally to this, dissolved and suspended constituents or particles in the water column can attenuate most of the light received through you know, absorption and scattering. So that means when it actually comes to retrieving information about shallow water ecosystems, which we're really interested in, coastlines and nearshore waters, even in the clearest waters under the clearest skies, we're actually really only looking at 10% of the signal that actually originates from benthic substrates. So if we're wanting to map things like seagrass, um, coral reef that's submerged, uh, or sandy substrates, we've only got a tiny proportion of the signal that we can work with. And so that's why designing sensors that are really optimal for obtaining that signature is really important, but also quite challenging. So I put this image up because I'm sure you are all very familiar with um, the blue marble image. You know, it was taken, I think, in 1972 by an astronaut, I think, on the Apollo 17 mission, but somebody here might want to correct me. But I think um, it's a really amazing image because it really catches the pulse of the Earth, Earth and our oceans. And there's a reason it's called the blue marble, and that's because we're predominantly looking at a blue surface. It's an iconic image. Um, but I think it really nicely depicts the vulnerability of our planet within this sort of vastness of space. And it really highlights where we're at in time um, and why, if we're looking at trying to understand the impacts of climate change on our planet, um, Earth observation is really instrumental, instrumental in trying to achieve that. So why do we use Earth observation and, and satellite platforms to look at our coasts um, and why the urgency? So you're probably all familiar with um, the recent IPCC and six assessment report that came out fairly recently. And an important finding in that was that our coastal areas, and I'm sure most of you all live on the coast, will see continued sea level rise throughout the 21st century. Um, and that's, we're pretty confident about. The scientists and modelers are fairly confident about. And um, that will contribute to you know, more frequent and severe coastal flooding in low-lying areas and coastal erosion. So we're often focusing on low-lying areas, but the reason I put this image here on the right is that um, you'd all be familiar with the, the um, elevated cliff areas around our Sydney shoreline and the insane property values associated with its locations. And this was an extreme storm event in 2016. You can see these properties are actually affected by storms even though they certainly wouldn't be defined as low-lying. So extreme sea level events that you know, previously occurred maybe every one in, one in a, once in a, every 100 years could be happening sort of on a yearly basis by the end of this century. We also need to be able to get a handle on mean sea level rise. So global mean sea level rise is um, increasing and the, the models are fairly confident, virtually certain that this is happening and with a high level of confidence it is probably accelerating. So when we think about the sum of glacial and ice sheet contributions, contributions in, in um, you know, that's sort of now the main dominant source of, of global mean sea level rise. Over the next, by the end of the, this century, uh, that rise will be anywhere between 43 centimetres to something like um, 84 centimetres. Um, and that's reasonably likely by the end of the century based relative to um, sea level between 1986 and, and 2005. So often when we sort of cite these figures, we're looking at anomalies to, to past sea levels and, and trends. The other thing I really wanted to point out, and this is why coasts and oceans are really important, is when we look at um, what we often refer to as climatic impact drivers, and which ones are predicted or projected to increase or potentially decrease, which ones are going to increase with a fair amount of uh, confidence. When we break these down and we have a look at them in this slide, we include things like mean surface temperature, extreme heat, cold spells, frost, um, permafrost, uh, changes in sea ice. The area that's pretty much all predicted um, to be you know, the key drivers all fall within that coastal ocean uh, realm. So relative sea level, um, coastal flooding, coastal erosion, marine heat waves and ocean acidification. So it sort of highlights when you think about all these climate drivers, where the critical ones are sitting. And that's why um, being able to observe them from space is really important. 
I guess the other thing is that so many people on, in the globe live very close to the coast. And, you know, over 190 million people currently occupy land that's projected to be under high tide levels by the end of this century. And that's actually under low carbon emission predictions. And then there's probably about a billion people that actually live in lands that are less than 10 metres above current tide levels. So the other issue is that, you know, the inevitability of sea level rise is the reality for many low lying coastal communities. And sea level rise is not globally uniform, it varies regionally. And if you look at this um, data set here or this, this map here, this shows, um, you know, since the start of satellite records, so looking at sea level um, altimetry or, or elevation between 1993 and 2018, the mean sea level, sea level rise has risen across most of our world oceans. But in particular ocean basins like the South Pacific, sea level rise has, has increased by 15 to 20 centimetres. So it's fairly significant. And I guess the point here I'm making is that it's not uniform, it's, it's higher in certain areas. So that sort of highlights the importance and why we're doing this research. Another rationale is that um, of blue carbon environments. So some of the most crucial climate combating coastal ecosystems cover less than you know, half a percent of the seabed. Yet, so these are what we often refer to as the three amigos, seagrass, mangroves and salt marsh. And living in Sydney, you're all very probably quite familiar with these environments and the impact of coastal squeeze or urban encroachment or development in these particular areas, because they're disappearing faster than any other land-based or terrestrial-based ecosystem. Yet they sequester, they have potential to sequester more carbon or 5% more carbon than um, tropical forests. So being able to map and monitor these environments is also really important, but particularly challenging. Um, I guess really simply, the science behind it is that um, these systems uh, suck up the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They uh, store it, so when um, sequestered, so I guess they're absorbing it through processes of photosynthesis, a sequestration um, through um, material, uh, organic material that then deposits in these uh, sediments and, and a lot of the carbon in these environments are actually stored in the sediments more so than the above ground biomass. And that's all fine until these systems get disturbed. So clearing of mangroves can re result in a significant release of carbon back into the atmosphere. And that has obvious uh, consequences. So it's important, you know, we do this work because it's important to understand um, how these systems are responding to climate change, anthropogenic or human influence and uh, impact on these environments, um, being able to map and monitor, you know, critical blue carbon areas. But from a geopolitical perspective as well, when you think about um, how Australia and other neighbouring nations define their economic zones or their economic exclusive economic zones, we actually need to know where the coastline is because a lot of these boundaries are defined by distance from coastal features. So 200 nautical miles from a base point coastal feature. And um, this sort of all sits under the treaty of the um, you know, uh, law of the sea. Uh, which was ratified in the early 80s, when we weren't really thinking about climate change. But when you look at this map here, it shows um, the jurisdictional boundaries of many of our South Pacific neighbours. And when we think about Pacific states, often they're referred to as small island states. But in actual fact, they're, marine, they're large marine nations, if you like. They have vast marine areas that have importance because um, that provides jurisdiction, national jurisdiction over important marine resources. So whether that be seabed mining or um, fisheries or whatever. Um, but defining these boundaries can be reasonably controversial because obviously you're negotiating boundaries between countries and they're often defined by these uh, coastal base point features. So the examples of these images that I've got here are um, very remote uh, island or atoll islands that define the jurisdictional boundary of nations. Um, and this one here is a defining feature for the uh, exclusive economic zone uh, of the Fijian archipelago. Now, under changing sea level and changing supply of sediments that would um, enable these 
coral atoll islands to form. And you can see in these images here, they're very small. There's a tiny patch of vegetation that's stabilizing these sediments. So if you have things like ocean acidification going on and, and, climate, and sea level changes, what's actually happening to these islands? And the only way to really know is through satellite data and the high resolution satellite data. So that's why all these um, data sets are really important. Um, you're probably all familiar with the, the heritage or the history of uh, remote sensing. You know, it goes back to 1858 when a uh, fairly famous German, German professor started taking aerial photographs and balloons um, over the Bavarian landscape. And then in 1903, the famous squadron of pigeons, you know, were fitted with these lightweight cameras. Um, I don't think animal ethics was an issue in those days. But you can see here that um, it wasn't, it obviously had uh, clear limitations because we can see the wings of the pigeons on either side of that image um, here. So you didn't really have an unobstructed views of the landscape, but this is actually really the false, first forms of remote sensing um, and earth observation in a very rudimentary form. Uh, and then obviously it's evolved over time and um, particularly during the Cold War, covert surveillance um, sort of resulted in all sorts of spin-offs and, and led to the development of colour infrared film, uh, which has been particularly useful for measuring things like vegetation health. So um, then we come to how this fits into the ARC training centre for CubeSats, UAVs and their applications, which is led by Eva Kantz. Um, there's multiple components to this uh, training centre. And I think what's really exciting about the centre is it really also provides not only an opportunity to uh, collaborate with um, some really leading edge industry partners, but also it's an opportunity for, um, I guess, if you like, training the next cohort of space scientists and, um, and entrepreneurs. So uh, we have you know, a team of really talented PhD and postdoctoral um, candidates and, and research fellows. And um, there are different components to the QAVA um, program, but the one that I'm involved in is really looking at focusing on how we can um, apply a lot of the data product, products that will be derived from, from CubeSats. Um, and it's an iterative process, as I mentioned before, we're testing these instruments, these Earth observation instruments on UAVs before they go into space. Um, but CubeSats really provide a new paradigm in Earth observation. Um, because satellite-based monitoring is obviously, you know, always a trade-off between spatial, spectral, and temporal resolution. And by working in this sort of multidisciplinary um, environment that, that QABA provides, we can look at how we can really push the boundaries of those trade-offs and work out where there could be some synergies. Um, so traditionally, a lot of the data that we use we sourced uh, were sourced from single sense la sensor launches. And a lot of these previous data or existing Earth um, or um, national level space agency um, platforms are designed to sort of not be one size fits all, but address many different applications. The opportunity in QAVA we have is to design sensors that are specific for particular applications. And so that's where we're looking at how we can design sensors that specifically address some of the challenges that we're dealing with in coastal science. And um, when you look at the research and the history of the research over the last sort of five years in CubeSat based publications, most of that research has predominantly been in engineering and earth and planetary sciences and very little in the environmental science side of um, things and applications. So that's really where QR was sort of pushing um, these sorts of applications. Um, so when we think about it, I'm not gonna go into this at length because I'm sure you're all very familiar with um, how earth observation data is is captured and, and, um, and used in looking at detecting features on the planet. Um, but when we think about it, if we're looking at the electromagnetic spectrum, we're really only looking at a very small proportion of that. And so that's particularly relevant in coastal applications because we're dealing with the issue of water, which means we don't have much of this electromagnetic spectrum to work with. Um, we're also using unoccupied aerial vehicles or UAVs or otherwise known as drones or R, uh, uh, what is it about? RPAS as well, remotely piloted aerial systems. Um, there's multiple terms for, for, I guess, what we could really refer to as the same thing. Um, but where they're particularly valuable um, as a first step or first phase to testing um, applications, testing sensors before they go into space, 
um, and that they provide an alternative, um, but reasonably conventional platform. Uh, they might be not just limited to um, a typical drone that we think of, but also quadcopters and balloons um, can be used for stationary monitoring. Uh, I guess the advantage of UAV payload is we're looking, looking at miniature payloads as we would be doing in, in CubeSat systems as well, but allows us to um, capture data using LIDAR so we can get really detailed terrain or topographic information that gives us really specific um, detail on how our coastlines are changing. But the challenge that we have is that um, we're dealing, when we're working in marine areas, there's often a lot of um, solar reflection or sea cutter or what can also be known as um, sea, uh, sun glint. So I guess the challenge is that light's passing to and reflecting from a benthic surface. So we're dealing with uh, the water column and also the atmosphere. So we get spectral scattering and um, you know, often in the water column, we've got phytoplankton, suspended organic and inorganic um, substances. And the, the image that I've got up here is some work that was collected very recently by, by one of our PhD students, Alex Jones, who's interested in being able to detect whales ultimately from space, but a lot of the work so far has been uh, using UAVs. So whales will obviously surface debris, but a lot of the time they're spending underwater. So um, the reason these uh, we need to be able to monitor uh, marine animals um, is that a lot of the, many of the humpback whale species that migrate along the east coast of Australia. Uh, in the northern migration, the southern migration has just come to, to an end as they're heading back down to the nutrient-rich um, austral, uh, sorry, um, Antarctic waters in that, the austral summer or the um, southern hemisphere summer, is that they pass through a number of uh, defence water training grounds, including Jervis Bay. So that has implications if you have resting whales um, conflicting with um, naval activities and training activities. So um, the reason we've got researchers in Kuava focusing on this is we want to be able to detect whales even when they're submerged under the water surface. So the challenge there is coming up with algorithms where we can remove the effect of water and actually see the, these animals without, um, which we wouldn't normally be able to do if we're just looking at um, red, green, blue images. So we can use near infrared bands and thermal imagery to be able to detect where they might be. But as I mentioned before, I guess this image here really just illustrates the challenge that we're dealing with. Um, so the effect of depth and um, scattering that occurs because of particular matter can affect the signal that we end up receiving. So when you look at um, the sort of reflectance in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, this graph shows kind of neatly what really happens once you go beyond the blue, green, red um, component of the uh, spectrum. And the difficulty of, so near infrared bands are really useful for removing the effects of depth and water attenuation, but it doesn't, we can't use it to then map seagrass beyond and, and benthic sub substrates beyond a certain depth. The other um, challenge that we have is that obviously, you know, you might be familiar with the difference between hyperspectral image data and multispectral image data. So in multispectral images, we may only have a, a restricted number of bands. So we're only seeing and being able to absorb, absorb really small parts of that the spectrum. So we're only getting details um, where the, those bands are placed. And so we might be missing really important um, aspects of say coral growth or um, bleaching that may not be um, detected within the bands that are available within the multispectral image. But by having um, vast amounts of data in the hyperspectral images, we might be able to pick up some of those subtle differences and changes as um, these environments are being affected by um, you know, warming temperatures. So I guess the point here I'm making is that spectral confusion increases with depth as you've got greater light attenuation, which then reduces the range and intensity of light frequencies recorded by the sensor. So if you look at this graph here, um, we might be able to use the blue, green, red band and maybe even the infrared band um, if we're looking at things that are just a few centimetres below the water surface. But once you get down to about five metres, you're really losing um, the spectral resolution uh, within the infrared band. And then beyond sort of 10 or 15 metres, even the red band can be fairly useless. So that's, that's important um, when we're mapping things like seagrass and um, nearshore habitats 
because we're actually needing what's more important is to have sensors that give us greater detail in that blue green range. And so this graph here shows you um, the spectral data in multispectral imagery available through um, Landsat 8 and Landsat 9 is, has a very similar arrangement of bands and Sentinel uh, platforms that have been providing data really since about 19, uh, sorry, 2016. Um, and this is compared with a UAV based sensor that we've re recently acquired. And um, thanks to COVID, we haven't been able to go out into the field and, and test it until last Tuesday was the first, um, sorry, yes, yeah, so a week ago was when we first collected um, data using this platform, which we've actually had for almost nine months now. Um, but you can see this particular sensor, the Red Edge NX actually has additional bands in the blue-green range, which is really useful for mapping seagrass, and additional bands in that red, near-infrared um, part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And why that's important is you can see that steep slope, it's called the red edge, red slope, and shifts in that slope are actually really useful for detecting um, changes in vegetation health. So if we're looking at things like mangrove dieback up in the Gulf of Carpentaria, we might want to use these sorts of data sets to be able to see very subtle changes in vegetation health to be able to then predict where those dieback events may be occurring or be able to anticipate where those dieback um, events will, will be occurring. And then, of course, we've got the issues of spatial resolution, which is um, the old chestnut nut that um, we often debate with um, those that are designing the optical sensors that are going to be going on, on CubeSats. And I guess we're always um, pushing for finer and finer spatial resolution, and I'm sure Eva's probably having a laugh at this because um, we're often wanting the finest spatial resolution we can get. And you can see in this image why this is so important. So on the far left, you can see a um, drone acquired image, which has a spatial resolution of about four centimeters versus what sort of um, information we can acquire about these same seagrass beds if we're um, mapping it using, say, for example, a Landsat platform at 30 meter resolution. So you can see that loss of detail that we're often seeing. And from a scientific perspective, we really need that resolution to be able to see what's going on in these, in these ecosystems and to be able to monitor um, and determine which ecosystems are really important for things like blue carbon. So I guess um, this is where the power of CubeSats come in, into the story in that they allow us to rethink methods in coastal science. And we've seen that in the sorts of research that's come out in the last few years through data that's been using the planet um, CubeSat uh, images. So it's encouraging us to sort of review approaches to data to capture, to managing the data, interpreting and modeling it. And that's where we need to have really sophisticated computational uh, algorithms and systems and cloud computing to be able to deal with this really prolific um, increase in data sets. So um, before I finish up, I just want to give you one example of how we're using this data to address some issues um, in the coastal science issues in the South Pacific. So we're involved in a project working in Tonga and, and Fiji. And these, um, I guess the impacts of climate change are really acutely felt um, by populations that are living and communities that are living in these low lying coastal areas. Um, the mangrove areas that you can see in that top top of image in this slide, the dark or the denser green um, section of that map is a really extensive mangrove community that um, has formed along a deltaic uh, system. So whether this river reaches um, the sea and it's quite a complex set of mangroves, but th they have really important ecosystem resources because these mangrove communities provide a buffer also from extreme storm surge events and from cyclones. So we were interested in working out and using satellite data and Earth observations to work out um, how effective these mangroves are in protecting um, villages and communities from extreme cyclone events. So we used um, vegetation indices that can be derived from Landsat and Sentinel images to work out which areas of these mangroves were actually most affected. And that image in the lower left side of this slide is a photo that we took very soon after that cyclone event. You can see there was sort of extreme damage to particular patches of mangrove. And we went into the field and took um, field spectrometer data so we could match up the, the spectral signatures we were getting in, um, in these vegetation areas or these mangrove areas and match them to the satellite data. 
um, which was fantastic field work when we, we could access these areas. Obviously, we hadn't been back to these landscapes. So just before COVID restrictions came in, we put a um, phenology or a pheno can uh, on, attach them onto the mangroves in this area. Uh, we don't know if that camera is still there. There's been um, extreme storm events since then as well. Um, but the idea is that that in situ uh, monitoring system or that camera would give us information on vegetation phenology. We, we plan to be doing that for 12 months, but obviously that's now been going for almost 18. Soon it will be two years of data um, that we haven't been able to go back and collect. Um, but what we were doing here is match, mapping the um, mangrove health before uh, the cyclone event and after. And those red areas that you can see in the lower right side on the screen, that map there, shows all the areas that were, where you've got major amounts of or, um, increased vegetation loss um, post-cyclone. And uh, what we found is that was associated with particular areas in the mangrove um, landscape, but also particular species. So they're really tall. Um, the, the, the site's dominated by only about three mangrove species, but the really tall um, Brigaria, which is used by the communities to build houses, which was really important for reconstructing um, houses post-cyclone, were the ones that were most damaged um, by this cyclone event. So we can use satellite data to sort of get a handle on how extreme cyclone events and, and extreme um, storm surges and, and uh, weather conditions can actually impact on the, the ecosystem services that these coastal environments provide for local communities. Because these local communities, um, their livelihood is inextricably linked to um, these environments. So once they're damaged, and, and this is particularly relevant um, in these intertidal mangrove areas, where a lot of women in the community are dependent on these landscapes for um, harvesting mud crabs and, and uh, mollusks. And that was all uh, damaged during the cyclone event. So that had implications for household income. And so there were so all sorts of livelihood issues that were associated with this. But I guess the advantage of using satellite data is that we can look at changes in the health of the, of the mangrove ecosystem and be able to differentiate the different types of mangroves. And um, this is a, a really important area also for uh, blue carbon. So if these communities want to look at things like payment for ecosystem services, so protecting these areas and then accessing, having access to global climate funds to be able to support the protection of those areas, they need to be able to monitor how they're being protected. So I guess the challenge then is, you know, what opportunities do CubeSats provide um, for being able to provide really useful and new data sets that we don't actually have access to in standard satellite platforms like uh, Landsat and, and Sentinel. I guess we're interested in um, band position. So where we're capturing data on particular, um, you know, placements on the electromagnetic spectrum, how many bands might be on a sensor and how wide those bands might be. So, um, the next iteration of uh, the Cuava CubeSat is looking at having um, close to a hyperspectral um, sensor or, or um, instrument that will give us continuous uh, or record, record or continuous bands along the electromagnetic spectrum. But what we're particularly interested in for coastal applications is that blue green area. Um, so, why that's important is that it's the ability. So band position and number and, and width really uh, is, refers to the ability of a sensor to be able to distinguish between wavelength intervals in the electromagnetic spectrum and determines how well, you know, an individual target, whether that be a patch of seagrass or a um, vegetation or a um, commercial cro agricultural crop or mangroves um, can actually be discriminated. And um, we're looking at measured reflectance, which is really the average uh, the average reflectance across the band width. So what that means is that wide bands, and if you remember that previous graph I showed you, that Landsat and Sentinel bands are reasonably large, um, are actually not so great for detecting um, subtle differences in on target features. So being able to distinguish, say, really subtle changes or very early warning system indicators of change in vegetation health, if we're looking at things like mangrove dieback. But the problem with narrow bands is that um, you've got, you know, signal to noise decreases with increased um, 
spectral resolutions and narrow bands. So that's really because you've got signal strength that is weaker in the smaller bands, but you've still got a constant um, background noise. So this is a challenge that we face in trying to come up with a sensor that's particularly useful for mapping seagrass and mangroves and coastal areas and being able to monitor changes in sea level and shoreline. So just to finish off here, I guess I want to highlight that the challenges and, and the, the work that we're involved in in Suava is really um, thinking inside the box um, and it really is a small box. So how do you address these sort of challenges when you're looking at um, miniaturized sensors, so very small sensors. Um, but the other, other challenge that we have is that these platforms and the proliferation of these platforms means that we're actually getting a proliferation of Earth observation data. So we're getting vast amounts of data. So we need to come up with and rethink some of the spatial and geographical methodologies that we, we have previously used. Um, how do we handle this, this volume of data? Um, how do we develop um, algorithms that might actually sit on the sensor or on the, on the satellite platform to handle these vast volumes and actually only download the data that we actually need, particularly in tropical areas. We don't want to be necessarily accessing vast amounts of satellite images that are completely cloud covered. So how do we sort of narrow down those data sets so we're only getting what we need? And inevitably, we're dealing with trade-offs in the sorts of things that we can actually achieve. All right, I'll, I'll finish up there. Well, uh, thanks very much. I've got a couple of questions that I'll just read in there before we get the um, uh, the actual Q&A verbally from people. Um, last one, this has been sent by Janine, is the satellite imagery to monitor the impact of extreme events is vital, especially in looking at resilience. But I wonder how changing sea temperatures may also be changing currents and ongoing sand movement impacts on coastal ecosystems. Yeah, so, um... So sea surface temperature changes certainly are changing current processes. Um, and then that obviously has implications for um, not just current movements, but also where we're seeing particular um, and the, the, the range of particular marine species. So that's you've probably seen in the media where you get um, announcements that tropical species are now being sighted down in Tasmanian waters. Um, that sort of is all linked to changes in, in water temperature. I think the question relating to sand movements um, is important because once you get, so changes to sea level will actually change um, the sediment dynamics in coastal areas. So you might see an accretion or, or build up of sand banks and um, intertidal areas that then affects what can grow where. So mangroves are intertidal communities. If, um, you have sea level rise and increased sedimentation in those coastal landscapes, you can actually see a dieback of mangroves. They may, they may no longer survive where they used to previously be. And then if you've got urban development right on the boundary of those coastal ecosystems, there's no opportunity for them to move landward. So that's often also what we refer to as coastal squeeze. Um, and in terms of sediment supply, um, when you think about a lot of uh, sand, particularly in coral atoll areas, it's actually composed not necessarily of quartz, but also of um, calcareate material. So that's secreted by um, you know, shells and, eco and ex exoskeletons. And you're probably familiar with the implications of ocean acidification and what that means um, in that some of these um, uh, calcareate secreting um, organisms uh, are probably potentially more vulnerable to ocean acidification. So we've got researchers in the School of Geosciences looking at what that means then for um, reef forming organisms that actually um, contribute to sand supply in those um, island systems. And if you get less sand supply, does that mean that some of these islands won't be there by the end of this century? I've also Janine's asked a question I think on one of your earlier slides, uh, Eleanor. Um, this is about actually somewhere over in East Africa. Has the monitoring system determined the impact of the ocean heating from the rise of the new undersea volcano between Madagascar and East Africa? I hadn't actually heard of that one. It lies on the seafloor at a depth of about 3,500 metres. It is 820 metres tall and has an estimated erupted volume of over six 
cubic kilometers. Oh, it's, quite, it's not small. Um, okay. It's huge, and it only came two or three years ago. Yeah. H has there any been any current change, or obviously the seas heated because I think they've had quite a bit of flooding in um, Mozambique and and uh, down that east coast. You said near near me, Mota Island. Yeah, it's it's just between Madagascar and East Africa. They've had a big hy hydrology system change there, but I was just wondering if. If, it, if it's affecting the whole Indian, Indian Ocean ecosystem yet? Yeah, look, I'm not familiar with that system at all. Um, yeah, so I, I, I couldn't really answer that question, uh, whether it's a localised change in, in marine temperature or whether that then has a sort of flow on effect because of the um, interconnectivity with, with um, you know, ocean currents and systems. Um, and I don't know how well it's been monitored. I do know that some of the um, subterranean volcanoes that contribute to these temporary islands in like in Tonga are monitored using satellite data. Um, and I think they're, they're fantastic, you know, really interesting systems, but it's, it's not my area, but I do have colleagues in geosciences that work on this. Yeah, I had a question, Eleanor, about your areas of research at the moment. I'm assuming that one of the big problems you've got with the COVID at the moment is that some of the things in mangroves you're studying specifically are in um, southern Queensland and um, you can't necessarily travel up there to, uh, personally to be able to do some of the work, assuming it yeah. is having an impact and you might be able to really do stuff until early next year, I think when the borders will open. Yeah, and we were actually planning to go and map um, some of the seagrass in Shark Bay as well in WA. Um, oh, okay. That's well, not going to be it's, it's going to have to happen at least after February, but I think you'll, you may be able to get to Queensland in, in February of next year, I think, based on the way that the borders will be opening. The, yeah, that... though we have some pretty impressive mangrove systems, um, even in the Sydney area. So we've okay. been, you know, the, the um, data that was captured last Tuesday was just on the Hawkesbury. Right. Um, so, and we've been capturing data over that site since just the beginning, so just before the first 2020 COVID lockdown. But of course, we didn't anticipate for the lockdown to be quite so long this year. So we were assuming we we're going to be getting a lot of flights in. But there are areas in Sydney that have seagrass, salt marsh and, and mangroves. Of course, the best area is over the Sydney um, airspace, the Sydney airport airspace. So that does add another uh, problem in terms of flying UAVs. Yeah, actually, I had a question on UAVs myself. It looks like the, the ones there that, that you would have been a bit lucky in respect that the UAVs improved quite considerably over the past couple of years. Almost anybody can buy them, so to speak, at JB Hi-Fi. But, um, but the, the, you'd be using larger ones with a few cameras on them, wouldn't you? And that's the one thing that the all that uh, digital stuff's improved considerably over the last five years in terms of what you'd be able to get out of those now in terms of the resolution. Yeah, the sensors and yes, the uh, sensors, yeah. bands on those sensors are um, more sophisticated than they were even a few years ago. And they're also bigger yeah. drones too, so you can get larger payloads on them. That's well. right, yeah, yeah. So we did, I mean, I guess that's the advantage of being able to work within Qarva is that we uh, are able to train our PhD students to be able to fly them as well. So mm. that's an opportunity for the students. Okay. Whales? Yeah, go and ask about whales. Uh, can I? Um, I I'm, I'm aware that you've been studying whales. Could you give us a little summary of what things you're looking for or what you hope to find out about whales in yours? Yeah, that's a, that's a fun question. And um, so we have a PhD student I mentioned earlier, um, Alex Jones, and that this project was sort of instigated by defence because they were really concerned about um, the interaction of naval activities and humpback whales migrating down the coast, particularly in areas like Harvey Bay and Jervis Bay, mm. because the whales as they migrate from the breeding grounds in Queensland, the Great Barrier Reef, where they breed and calve, it means that the, the mother calf pods or pairs um, groups of whales are uh, often needing to rest on their way down to Antarctica. And they tend to come into shallow sort of embayments to do that. And these embayments happen to coincide with where defence training areas are. So Jervis Bay is where you have a lot of um, mother calf resting whales. Um, and so Alex and I have been using UAVs because we're interested in working out whether thermal data can be used to detect 
not only where the whales are, but also where they may have been. So a lot of the time they're underwater, they're submerged, we can't see them. But when they surface, um, when they're near the surface, they bring cold water. So you've got cold water upwelling as they move around. And it's sometimes that cold water that really gives a really interesting thermal signature. And we can characterize that pattern or that thermal signature on the surface of the water. Um, so what we're interested in doing is, that, is trying to work out whether the pattern in that thermal signature that's quite distinct on the, on the water surface can be associated with particular whale behavior. Because if they're just passing through and they're moving, you just get these sort of round circles as they come up and their, their dorsal, the, sorry, their tail fluke um, brings the cold water up and then moves down. So it's almost like uh, footprints along um, in a linear pattern. But if they're resting, and particularly mother calf pods need to rest and they come into the embayments to rest, they'll actually be, um, their behavior will be really quite different. And there's some amazing footage that Alex has just acquired. Um, two weeks ago of resting whales, mother calf whales. And it's the first time that that pattern of behavior has been observed in, in Jervis Bay or on the New South Wales coast. Um, and the thermal signature is quite different. So if we can use that thermal signature to try and link that to particular behaviors, that's quite useful because then we can say, well, these environments are really important resting grounds. So they should be protected under marine protection, you know, marine parks, or zones to make sure that um, those resting animals are actually um, not going to be impacted by um, commercial activities, people wanting to dive with them or, um, or naval activities. Cool. So Lou's asked a question related to that, I think. Any monitoring of sounds in the water, contribution of machine noise in whales Beaching. Okay, I'm trying to think whether you might be thinking about extra noise coming from other things apart from the whales, though. Luke. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And there's a lot of research on using um, acoustics, um, marine acoustics, and, and Dale, uh, sorry, Doug Cato, who's a, um, previously at, at DST, has done research on this for many decades, and he's probably kind of one of the world's leading researchers in this space, and, and he works closely with Alex and I, um, to look at, um, so he's done a lot of research on whale behaviour response to um, noise generating human activities. So that could be um, naval vessels or seismic surveys that can also impact on uh, whale behaviour. Mm -hmm. And also um, uh, now we're, we're seeing obviously increasing things like wind farm constructions in uh, coastal waters that can have an influence potentially on, on whale movement and, and behaviour. The, the science behind that is still a, a little uncertain, but um, yeah, so you can use um, what's called passive acoustic monitoring to look at the impact of the existence of noise that may impact on whales. So do you ever base the, um, sorry, the, um, like if use your UAVs based from either a military ship or a commercial ship, because you're kind of looking at the interaction. So if you had somebody who was doing their UAV study from one of the ships, uh, have, have you done that yet? Or is that something you're hoping to get moved towards? Not yet, we'd love to do that. We would love to do that work um, with Casey Wong and, um, you know, it's whether where the defence would be interested in funding that, but I think there's opportunities there because you get better thermal signature from above um, from things cruise like cruise ships. <laughs> That's another application. Yeah, yeah. When they they want to be able to see whales going down to Antarctica. Yeah. Actually, there was a special on Apple TV a few months back talking about the impact of COVID last year in 2020, and they actually had a. I think it was up in up towards Alaska or something. And they said that because of the lack of people going on cruises around that area, they were actually able to pick up all this whale, uh, uh, whale um, sounds and the whales were actually talking to each other a lot more than what they normally would be due to the fact that there wasn't the same amount of boats around the place and large, large cruise ships. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't seen that. Uh, um, yeah, it was on Apple TV. It was the special that David Attenborough did. Right, yeah. Well, the influence of marine noise on whales, you know, there's a lot of research on that. Um, well, I thought that was fascinating when they were talking yeah. about the fact that they worked out how they were trying to then change the way that they were move, doing movement in that area so that it wouldn't interfere with the whales talking so much. 
Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of, uh, I mean, there's whole environmental regulations around um, shutting down seismic surveys if, if a whale sighted within the area. Mm. And, and the general rule is that um, it's, you know, got to be within, you know, if there's a whale within a, a certain distance, 500 metres of a survey, then everything's got to be shut down, which is incredibly expensive for the seismic survey company. Yeah, certainly. Mm. Okay, so have we got any further questions to ask on all tonight? I think there are some in the chat, Wayne, but I also have a question in due course if you want. Oh, okay. Yes, a couple just come up now. I just noticed, yes, I seem to be getting some, but they're a little bit late. Okay, so um, after Janine's got some. Wonder if monitoring can be linked with movements of the other fish and their predators' movements. Hmm. The monitoring whales to work out. The monitoring can be linked. Monitoring. Um, yep. So, yeah, monitoring of environmental, if you like, surrogates for um, particular species. So, if certain species are associated with particular habitats or sea surface temperatures or, or other things, then we can use that data, that environmental data, sea surface temperature or chlorophyll or, uh, content on the water surface to work, work out where, say, for example, tuna species. There might be a shift in, in the range of particular species associated with those conditions, but we really can only monitor the, the water surface. We can't go too far deep in that. Mm. Yeah, John, John, who comes from far north Queensland, has got this good question about uh, damage and recovery from cyclones. Um, uh, time longitudinal studies in place as cyclones occur periodically and recovery occurs over approximately two to three years. That's what he must be making a comment on that. Well, actually, I was reading today talking about the big big events that happened about 10 years ago. Myself, I was talking about this is the second La Nina in a row, and they said there's going to be possibly some big cyclone events up in Queensland. Um, I think they're talking about the flooding in Brisbane and also Cyclone Yasi. A, a very so we may get similar ones again coming up can i make a comment on that way yes, yes um it's just that i experienced my first cyclone in in north queensland in about not the mid 1950s and there's been cyclones regularly every five to ten years since and and the, the nature recovers as it does over that period so that situation that occurred in in that existed in say 2010 the vegetation that wasn't there ad infinitum. That had been periodically regenerated every five or so years. So the, <clears throat> so the expectation is that any damage that occurs now will be <clears throat> regenerated, not exactly, but to some extent um, to, um, uh, to a, a, a sustainable level. That's, that's my comment, thanks. Yeah. I, I think that's a very important point because you know coastal systems are dynamic. It's quite a natural process to have recovery after a cyclone event. Um, I guess the concern is the frequency intensity, the changes to the frequency and intensity of these events. Yeah, and also the fact that at the moment we're having um, longer La La El Nino events and shorter La Nina events, and they're not even, which is what's causing some of the big problems we've got at the moment with the, the ecosystems. If they're, if they're even, even in terms of the number of years for each of them, it probably be, more balancing, but at the moment we're tending to get more of the hot stuff and less of the cooler stuff, which is which is what's a bit frustrating, I think, at the moment. Um, Eleanor, I have a question which you may or may not want to uh, to answer in detail. It's to do with uh, the Coaba Two sensor and the distribution of the uh, wavelength bands. Um, I was just struck when you showed the red edge. Uh, where it seemed as though that's you know very sensitive to what the type of vegetation etc that that you that you have yes this this one here that it would make sense for us to have uh, perhaps fewer um, f fewer bands in the in the blue and the green and have more from about I don't know 650 to 800 or so nanometers. Uh, so as to capture the red edge better and be able to see to compare, um, well, compare the various features uh, in that range. Do you agree with that, or or do you think we should, or there are other features that we should see or look for in the blue? So, um, 
because coastal ecosystems are, you know, you've got uh, submerged seagrass, you've got salt marsh that's intertidally inundated, and you've got mangrove. But the mangrove canopy you'll always see, even at really high tide. So it's a mangrove. If you're wanting to look at health of mangrove canopy, then you want more bands in that red, red edge space. But if we're wanting to map seagrass we, um, and detect things that are submerged, then we want more bands in that blue-green range. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge. If we're wanting a sensor that can do both, um, we want to have both of those options. And I think um, Chris and Kevin's proposal for the QAVA2 sensor will give us that. Um, and I can't remember off the top of my head how wide those bands will be, but we will have continuous bands across that section of the spectrum. Um, yeah, I think it's, sorry, carry on. Yeah, I don't know. You might, I think it's 16. I don't know. Yeah, 15 okay. nanometers or yeah. 20. Yeah, that sort of range. Mm. Right. So then are, we can work out from that, okay, which ones are giving us better signature. Um, but also this Micasense um, uh, platform that we're capturing data from using the UAV will tell us how useful these extra blue bands and green bands are going to be. Mm -hmm. For Jamie's work, for looking at seagrass. Should, should we go higher, if, sorry, to shorter wavelengths? So to yeah, 300 yeah. or so, if we can? Oh, you mean going down, like beyond yes. like sub 400? Um, I'm not sure if there's really any benefit in that. Um, I think we're thinking of starting at about 430. Is that right? 430, 440? Um, nope, wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that was the last conversation. Um, I don't think there's benefit in going any lower than that, um, but potentially having you know, going further into that red edge. Um, right. <laughs> Although um, just recently, Anne and I have been um, trying to get uh, observations of uh, bioluminescence associated with uh, red, tide. red tide or algae. Um, yeah. And that presumably, I mean, that looks like a very vibrant light blue color. So will that but be? It's red, but it's red during the day. But it's red during the day. Uh, but the light blue will presumably be around about 500 nanometers from the looks of it. Well, so is that non-daylight non hours? Is that what you're thinking? Oh yes, it's in darkness too. That's true. Um, yeah. So that so that would be really interesting then, because then you could do a comparison depending on how frequently you can get the orbit um, over the same location, but the comparison of the nighttime daytime. Signatures might also give you confirmation that that's what you're looking at if you're getting that strong signature during the day in the red and getting a distinctive signature in that lower blue area at night. Mm -hmm. that, that, that would be really be good for good. tourism. <laughs> yeah, just yeah. like the aurora. The aurora is good for tourism and maybe uh, pink, uh, well, red tides, <laughs> yeah. bioluminescence. <laughs> yeah, I guess the challenge is like when you think it does occur down in Jervis Bay, but it's so sporadic, you don't have these consistent. Well, it's been around Sydney and the central coast over the last couple of weeks. Mm. Although we've so struck we've, out. We've, we've struck we've out, but. Tried to look for it. Seen some, seen <laughs> some good pictures though. <laughs> So I, I'm, we're monopolizing things. Other people may have questions. No? I don't see anything else in the well, chat. I was actually wondering, would it be possible if you put sensors on the seabed floor, uh, which transmitted to something just floating on the water surface, which the satellites could then pick up the information from? Would that be more effective rather than trying to see through the water all the time? Yeah, but it's always challenging having things that might sit on the substrate that then is emitting data on the surface because often it's really expensive to do it, but also currents and things can, like that can, uh, you can lose sensors quite easily. Okay. Mm. I'm just wondering about the difference in, in accuracy of the data being transmitted. That's all. Yeah. Is it, is, you know, where are you getting the most accurate data from? From putting sensors down in, on to, in, in amongst the grasses or in, uh, in trying to see through the water to the grasses? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So it's a bit of both. So you need to have validation calibration data. 
um, in situ, like going and either diving on those seagrass beds or having instruments down there. And that you then use to train the models that, um, and characterize the signature, the spectral signature that you're then recording on the satellite platform. And thank you for your answer earlier about the, the dummy, dummy variable possibility using surrogates. Uh, I think with uh, running algorithms sometimes it, it's, it's kind of handy to be able to just substitute some, some dummy variables in at times. Yeah, I mean, often in ocean landscapes you need to because you just don't have that amount of data in situ yeah. to be able to. Mm. <laughs> Any questions? You can ask one more, even. We've got. Oh, no, no, no. Well, I, I, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> but plus, Anne actually asked the one I was going to, going to ask about, um, you know, whether uh, you, Eleanor, and um, uh, Alex and Kevin had any exciting results from the recent UAV um, measurement. So you, you answered that for Alex. And so, yeah, that, that does. So that, that was going to be my other question. Yeah, I think um, so that even after, it's very recent. We only acquired this data two weeks ago, not even that, a week and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And it was touch and go because you've got to have everything aligning. You've got to have access to the airspace and that's military controlled. Um, you need to have good weather. If it's too windy or if it's raining, it's not going to work and the whales have to turn up. So this was our third attempt at capturing the data and we finally managed to get it. So yeah, we do have good thermal images. That was good that's, news. that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time now to, to put it all through the, through the modeling. <laughs> yes, well, it's to so analyze the observations, right? Yes. <laughs> so Alex has returned, she's really exhausted because she had to do that field work um, normally we'd have a team of eight people, but obviously because of COVID, we could only have three people. So um, PhD students return, she's recovering, and then she'll start processing the data. That's wonderful. She'll get some done before Christmas, but it's time is marching on. That's the only thing. <laughs> uh, yes. Sorry, I just saw the message. I will. Sorry, I didn't realise. I forgot I was still sharing the screen. Can I ask a question? You. you uh, great talk, thank you. You mentioned the IPCC reporting on uh, the impact of climate change in terms such as virtually certain high confidence, very high confidence, etc. Does anyone know if those terms are quantified like greater than 90% or less than 70% or anything like that, or are they just left in that vague state? Yeah, no, that information, if you drill into the report, you can find those figures. Um, but they're based on many different climate models as well. So, uh, yes, so the answer to that is it is in the report, but they're summarised in terms of low, very high confidence levels. Thank you. Probably the normal statistical confidence is based on those words. Mm. Well, you, you should be aware. I mean, the IPCC reports have a huge number of very able scientists uh, very explicitly talking about the quantitative details and looking to see uh, how certain uh, we can be of, certain, of various trends. So as Eleanor said, you know, is it, it is extremely highly uh, quantified. Um, and so they have very specific definitions of what certain, you know, highly certain means. Um, yeah, it's it. This is not uh, Trumpist st style stuff. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess the climate scientists tend to be fairly conservative. So if they're saying that, that means you've got many, many models or confirming similar results. Well, where do I find a simple table that gives the figures? Uh, so if you, yeah, I don't have the link, but if you go to that report that was released. Um, under the date, I think it was the first week of September, sometime in September. This yeah, year. very recently. There's a, yeah, there's an executive summary, and it's there's quite a good summary that's really designed for policy makers, and and uh, so it's kind of more accessible than the really detailed science, which is in the core part of the report. What's it? 
IPCC report. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that okay, so any more questions for Eleanor? Thank you so much, Eleanor. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, thanks Eleanor. So much. It was much appreciated. We enjoyed it. It was uh, very interesting, and we. We got onto quite a few different topics as well. <laughs> but then again, it's all your area of expertise anyway, isn't it? So it's great. Yeah, well, look, yeah, no, it was great. Um, well, I thank you, and I, I might head off. I've 